Hey, my name's Dean. I'm from Tallahassee, Florida. Uh, pastor of City Church there. Sp- spoke at the main session last night if you were here. I really enjoyed uh, being with you all. you got a great group. Really good thing happening here with Roundup. And it's just been cool to be all the way from Florida to be a part of it. Uh, I, I wrote a book, uh, and not, not this isn't a plug, but just like a perspective of what I've been thinking about for a while. Uh, I wrote a book called Pure, and, and the subtitle is like Why God's Design uh, for Sexuality is Not Oppressive. It's Not Irrelevant. Uh, and I, I think we need to make sure that we need to reclaim that belief and that conviction, uh, because what's happening right now in our society is that basic, basic, like fundamental Christianity 101 beliefs about marriage and sexuality have been labeled even by other professing Christians to be outdated, to be irrelevant, to be oppressive, you know, to be misogynistic, to be, uh, you know, not with the time. So we use so many words in terms of what we're just hearing. Not, not, not talking, and the unbelieving world will always think that. We're even hearing that from Christians now. They're allowing the world's narrative to influence them. And we kind of all do it under the banner of love to where we just say, well, because because we want to be loving, therefore we're going to affirm this, affirm that. It's anything from, you know, no-fault divorce to same-sex marriage to hookup culture to whatever it could be. Uh, So I I think it's really important if we're going to claim the name of Christ that we have to stand firm on what we believe to be true because our most greatest calling on our life, according to Jesus, the most important commandment is to love God. And the second most important commandment is to love our neighbor. Uh, so he actually ranked them in order. Like they asked him, what's the most important? And he didn't go, well, they're exactly the same. He said, the first most important is to love God. And one of the greatest ways you love God is by keeping his commandments, not to earn his love, but for us to love the one who loved us first. And then second is to Love our neighbor. He said, these are the most two, basically everything's summed up in these two things. So what I t- to tell our church regularly is we're not keeping the second commandment from Jesus if it causes us to violate the first. And that's what's happening now is in the name of thinking we're doing a good job keeping the second commandment. And by, I don't mean the 10 commandments I mean from Jesus that we're actually violating the first one. So I'm just going to walk you through. So I I believe how from a college ministry here in a college context, uh, how to communicate these ideas and how to really kind of return Christians. And I'm talking about strengthening Christians in this first and foremost, if we're going to go and reach the world, Uh, I think we need to first of all, develop a really strong biblical framework of why we believe what we believe, like how we're not crazy. Again, we're not oppressive. Like this is actually as, as Christian as Christian could possibly be. Uh, I, I argue that God's design for marriage and sexuality is as clear in the Bible as love your neighbor. It's as clear in the Bible as help the poor. It's as clear in the Bible as Jesus walking on water and turning water into wine. I mean, it's, it's that clear. So I want to walk you through not isolated commands, even though if it's God's word, isolated commands are sufficient, but how there's a framework and a biblical thread throughout the entire scriptures of one grand idea that God has for his people and the actual reason and purpose behind it. So I'm going to start in Genesis chapter 2. Because I think if we're going to reach a world with, for the gospel of Jesus Christ, we're going to have to figure out also how to communicate this. Because it's become a barrier, it's become a hurdle uh, towards really good Christian conversation and through relationships. Because one of the first things you get asked today is what do you think about, and they'll ask some kind of sexuality, gender question. So Genesis chapter 2, starting in verse 24 through 25. He says, this is why a man leaves his father and mother. As we've seen the creation narrative, we've seen Adam and Eve created. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and bonds with his wife and they become one flesh. Now it's important to know that the one flesh union is more than sex, but it's not less. There's an actual oneness, a one fleshness that occurs between a man and a woman as they were created to be. I'm not trying to be TMI here, but just simply by human anatomy. There's a one flesh union that takes place. Uh, that allows this oneness to occur. He says, both the man and his wife were naked, and yet they felt no shame. Why is that significant? Well, really important to know this. And we'll, we'll, be, we'll be reminded of this. The very next verse is Genesis chapter 3. And Genesis chapter 3 is the fall. That's when sin takes place. Why am I bringing that up? Because marriage was created before sin entered the world. So the marriage institution of a man and a woman in a one flesh union that should not be taken apart, that a new family being bonded, that there is no shame in that union. So why does it matter of the sequence? 
because it shows us that marriage and sexuality is not the problem. Sin is the problem. Like God has given us a good design, like that he has made for his own glory and by his own creative powers. He could have created any means he wanted to for procreation, for union, for oneness, for relationship. He's God. He could have done anything he wanted to do. But he takes a man and a woman. Biologically, it sufficiently works together. And there's a oneness that has taken place. And because there is no sin in the world, there's zero shame here. So the rest of the biblical story, sin enters the world. These people who at first had no shame now are ashamed. They have to cover themselves. And we can even say the rest of the biblical story is one of shame being taken away and the goal being to restore what took place in the Garden of Eden before there was sin. So the rest of the biblical storyline is kind of getting us back. It's kind of recovering and pursuing that grand idea. So it's common for someone to go, okay, well, that's Genesis. I don't really believe it's true. It's kind of metaphorical. It's, I mean, Genesis, really? I mean, like, you really think that, like, Noah's Ark, you really believe that's true? And, like, you really believe that God, like, made the world? And, I mean, like, aren't we a little past that, a little enlightened? Well, I do believe all those things are true. But if that's not enough for somebody, which it should be, uh, but if that's not enough for someone, we go to Jesus. And in Matthew chapter 19, he is asked about divorce. And here's what he does, and it's fascinating to me. He hasn't called anything creative. He hasn't tried to communicate anything new. He says in verse 4, Matthew 19, haven't you read? Like, hey, largely Jewish audience, haven't you read? He replied, that he who created them in the beginning made them male and female. And he also said, and here's Jesus about to simply just quote Genesis. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Then he takes it a step further for understanding and says, so they are no longer two but one. There's a, a true oneness. Therefore, as in because of this, because God has done this, what God has joined together, let no one separate. So people often say things like, Jesus never mentioned, you know, homosexuality. He didn't need to. Because all he's doing is he's defining marriage for them clearly and historically defining it as what God had first created marriage to be. And because God is the one who has made it this specific particular way, he said no one should separate that. No one should take it apart. So how fascinating that Jesus, who is admired by many on different perspective, different ends of the Christian spectrum, that everyone, and people, some people don't like Paul, some people, people don't like the Old Testament, everybody seems to like Jesus in the Christian spectrum, from like progressive to fundamentalist and everywhere in between. And here is Jesus saying, haven't you read? Like you asked me this question, I'm just going to remind you of what God has already said about this, as in it's settled. This is what God has designed. So then we get to see how that plays out into the rest of life and culture. And we get to 1 Corinthians 6. So Jesus has already risen from the grave, already ascended into heaven. The church is being formed. But the book of Acts is in play. Paul's on the scene. He's planting churches. He's sending out leaders. And then he starts getting word about how Christians are struggling of how to live out their faith in a secular context. And the believers in Corinth, 1 Corinthians 6 is where we'll be especially, uh, he got word, he got a note from the people there, the church, that one of the things that was happening, well, a few things. One, like there was lawsuits among believers at the beginning of chapter six, and it was hurting the mission or hurting the witness because the Christians couldn't get along. They're like suing each other. They're fighting. He writes about that and says, hey, guys, this is bigger than any of us. Like, what are we doing here? We need to be united. And then he also gets word about the sexual practices that were happening among believing Corinthians. And one of the things they were doing was, again, different era, different time, hard to kind of grasp this as being normal and being a regular thing that was taking place, is they were engaging in temple prostitution. So they would go into the community, down the main center square where the temple was located, and these professing Christian men would engage in prostitution at the temple. So Paul gets word of that, and he addresses it. And he says this to them. He says in chapter 6, he says, don't you know that your bodies, verse 15, are a part of Christ's body. 
And right before that, he says that the body is not made for sexual morality, but for the Lord. So our bodies actually do belong to God. Like we don't have personal autonomy over our own bodies, men, men or women. Like they belong to God. They belong to him. Like our, we, he, he purchased us. He purchased our souls. He brought us into his family. Like he is our Lord. So he, first he reminds him of that. And he says, don't you know your bodies are part of Christ's body? He said, should I take a part of Christ's body and make it part of a prostitute? And he says, absolutely not. Now, that might be, that's a pretty non-controversial verse to read. Because people all over the spectrum, I mean, there's a little movement that wants to legalize prostitution in the United States, but it's a small movement. But overall, people would agree with that that's a problem, you know, engaging in sexual relations with prostitutes. They might say things like it's demeaning, you know, to the person. You know, it, it, uh, they might say that it is, you know, it, it's an act of, you know, misogyny. It's an act of betraying a fellow image bearer. It's using someone. You might say today it fuels the trafficking industry. Um, you can just talk about it being unhealthy for both people in terms of just diseases and those kind of things. Uh, we can talk, you just go to, there's a lot of things. It's illegal. I mean, there's so many reasons why a Christian would go, yeah, like, let's not like have sex with prostitutes at the temple. Very non-controversial. But then he gives the reason why. And we see that his reasoning has nothing to do with actual prostitution. They just happen to be prostitutes. Here's what he says. Don't you know? In the threat of, haven't you read that anyone joined to a prostitute is one body with her? For the scripture says the two will become one flesh. The argument he gives as to why this is a problem is not, oh, because prostitution's bad. A secular person can make that argument. He points them back to Genesis. And says, God has created this to be a one flesh union, a permanency. So what you're doing is you're doing permanent things with temporary people. So the Bible does not present it as, oh, you had a hookup one night or, oh, you got carried away or went too far. But the Bible actually says you became one flesh with that person. Like that, that's what happens. And then he gives us a better solution. He goes, if anyone joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. So verse 18, because of what he just read, he goes, so flee sexual immorality, flee it. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. The person who is sexually immoral sins against his own body. So here he is telling us that he's debunking the myth that all sins are the same. I know we've all heard that before. All sins are equal. All sins are the same. Well, yes, in the fact that every sin requires equally the forgiveness of Christ. Like every sin that's ever committed, past, present, and future, depends on the blood of Jesus to be forgiven. So all sins are equal in the fact they all separate us from God apart from Christ. But functionally and practically, all sins are not the same. He says right here, when you sin sexually, you sin against your own body. Another reason why we should, why our sexual ethics we believe in the Bible are also for the good of our neighbor. To understand what's happening here. And just out of common grace and of love for people and human flourishing, we can look at 1 Corinthians 6 and say the world's idea is not how God designed it to mean it's not working. So he goes on to say, don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You're not your own, for you're bought at a price, so glorify God with your body. Usually when people use that, when people talk about that verse, they talk about like eat granola and, you know, do whole 30 and do yoga. And, you know, they think it's all about those. All you only eat, you know, grains from wherever, you know, that like it's talking about sexual morality, like glorify God with your body. Yes, there's other aspects of it. But here in this context, it's talking about sexual sin. So what is Paul's case that he makes? Not, hey, that's so bad because it's prostitution. Let's not do that. But don't you understand what's taking place here? You're taking God's design and placing it where it's not supposed to be. It's not, it's kind of like fire in a fireplace. Maybe you've heard this illustration before. Like fire in a fireplace is wonderful. Like people love it, right? Like Christmas time, I'm from Florida, we get like three days of it maybe. But, but, But you know, Christmas time, it's like fuzzy socks, Christmas music is playing, families together, you know, get out the apple cider, the hot chocolate, there's a fire you know, like cheesy Hallmark movie playing in the background. You know, it's like this kind of perfect scene. Fire in the fireplace is wonderful. Fire on the couch, not a good thing. Fire extinguisher, everybody's freaking out. Smoke alarm goes off. 
Call 911 if it gets too big, if it gets too big and you couldn't put it out. It's not the fire that's the problem. It's the location of the fire. The fire is taking place in an area where it was never designed to be. Fire is for the fireplace. It's not for the couch. In the same way, we could say that when we read the scriptures about God's design for sexuality, that sex is not designed for mature people or ready people or in love people. It's designed for married people. And that God has made it very clear that he has designed marriage to be between a man and a woman in a permanent union, as they say in wedding vows on a wedding day, until death do them part. So how interesting that here Paul in addressing this is not just throwing out these random rules for the sake of rules as we get kind of accused or thought of when it comes, like we're just kind of prudes basically. No, he's saying, I, I care about you. This is bigger than any act. This goes back to God's initial creation and purposes for this. And that's first Corinthians. So then the same author, Paul, we go to Ephesians chapter five, and it really kind of lands the plane in terms of what we've seen happen throughout the entire line of scripture. Ephesians chapter five. He says this. He's gave this amazing talk about the Christian life and being in careful attention, how you walk and how you live and talks about marriage and darkness and light and being imitators of God, like all these amazing things. And then he says this in verse 31. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Have you heard that yet today? <laughs> Have you heard that in the Bible yet? <laughs> like here's Paul pointing us back to Jesus, pointing us back to Genesis as historical. He's just quoting it. And he says, this mystery is profound, and it is. And it is a mystery, like what God has designed. It's like just the mystery of marriage and all that it entails. He goes, but, verse 32, I'm talking about Christ and the church. It's like, wait a second, I thought you were talking about marriage. Like, which one? Which one are you talking about? You talking about marriage? Or are you talking about Christ and the church? And his answer is yes. And it's like, wait a second, I'm frustrated now. Like, help me out here. You're talking about husbands and wives, and you say one flesh union, you point to Genesis, and then you say you're talking about Christ and the church. And he goes, well, to sum it up, the next verse, each one is you just to love his wife as his husband, as, as himself, and the wife is to respect her husband. So it's like, Paul, I'm still standing here confused. What he's doing here is he's showing you that when God created marriage, the gospel was already in mind. The gospel was already in play. It wasn't like God was sitting around one day and was like, oh, some people are going to sin one day. Let's have a plan. No, like this was the, our minds can't even comprehend. Like the plan to redeem a people to himself has existed for all existence. And marriage was a visible portrait of the invisible reality of the union between Christ and the church. In other words, the oneness of a husband and wife points us to the ultimate oneness, which is our union we have with Jesus Christ. An important doctrine of the faith is a union with Christ. I'd love for you to write that down on your own, like research union with Christ. Uh, it's just a really sacred doctrine of Christianity that we really are one with the Lord, but that we become one with him. So visible portraits uh, exist throughout our society and out our lives and throughout scripture and culture. Uh, for example, like if you forgive someone who's wronged you, uh, that is a, that doesn't even deserve your forgiveness because of what they've done, what they said about you, whatever it could be. That's a visible portrait of the invisible reality that God forgives us when we, that we've wronged him. Uh, when someone adopts a child into their family, that's a visible portrait of the invisible reality that in Christ, our heavenly father adopts us into his family. That we actually become children of God through adoption. Through our salvation, we're all God's offspring, but the way you become his actual children and he is your father is by faith. It's through Christ. John chapter one, only those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Uh, so there's this kind of examples when, you know, a, a parent loves a child. It's a visible portrait of the fact that our heavenly father loves his children. There's just so many portraits out there of this, of this taking place. Well, maybe the greatest one that exists is that the visible portrait of marriage points us to the invisible reality of our union with Christ and Christ in the church. So what Paul's saying here is that marriage actually is a gospel issue. It is a high level importance issue because if you get marriage wrong, you're messing with God's design and you're messing with what he has given us for the gospel. So then we see a very helpful illustration from Paul. 
about what it looks like to rebel against God's design. And it's all the human problem. In Romans chapter 1, he talks about a worship exchange that took place. So it's one thing just to go, oh yeah, well Eve, you know, ate the fruit and it was sin. And yes, it was. And that was the human, great human problem. But as I said in our session last night, we believe these two lies. There's more to be gained by disobeying God and there's to be gained by obeying him. And I have to go around God if I'm looking for in my life rather than actually write to God. That goes back to the Garden of Eden. That's what happened with Eve. So it wasn't just that Eve took the fruit. And yes, she did do that. It was an action that took place. She sinned in her actions. But it's even bigger what took place according to the scriptures. Eve made a worship exchange. She said, God, no thanks. I don't want to worship you. I want to worship basically me. I want what I want for me. So Romans 1 really begins by laying out the case of how, before it gives one of those beautiful presentations of God's love for us, understanding the gospel, the good news, it lays out the case of why we desperately need that love and need that grace and need that forgiveness. And it's because we've made a worship exchange. He says, for all the, verse 21, for though they knew God, they did not glorify him, God, or show him gratitude. Instead, as there's an alternative action, their thinking became worthless and their senseless hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. And what did they do? What did we do? We exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds, four-footed reptile, animals, and reptiles. That's one of the reasons why we call the cross of Christ and the fact that we receive his righteousness, the great exchange. He took on our sin and he gave us his righteousness. So in, in other words, we made an exchange and said, God, no thanks. And then in the same way, there's a reverse exchange that happens that Jesus then exchanges throughout through his death for us, his righteousness. And then what does he do? He gives a visible portrait of an invisible reality just like he does in Ephesians chapter five about men and women, husband and wife, Genesis chapter two. He says, therefore God delivered them over to the desires of their hearts to sexual impurity. I said, okay, you want that? You go do that. So their bodies were degraded among themselves. Remember it's, it's the Lord's body and you're taking it where it shouldn't be. And here's his visible portrait. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie in their sexuality and worshiped and served what had been created instead of the creator. That's the great exchange. Who is praised forever, amen. For this reason, God delivered them over to disgraceful passions. And what is the example he gives? He could have given us any example on earth of what rebellion looks like. And he says, their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. As in same-sex activity. Verse 27, the men in the same way also left natural as in how God created the relations to be natural relations with women and were inflamed in their lust for one another. Men committed shameless acts with men and received in their own persons, the appropriate penalty for their error because they liked men less than that excuse me, more than that, but not less. Not because of that specifically, but because they rebelled against God. That's the big issue. So then he says, and because they did not, here it is, think it worthwhile to acknowledge God, God delivered them over to their corrupt mind so they do what is not right. And then he goes on to list all these specific sins. So he says, he's not singling this out. He goes on to talk about greed and evil and wickedness and envy and gossip and deceit and malice. Like he's talking about all these things. But why would he have locked in on same-sex relationships as his example of his visible portrait of invisible realities? Because he's saying, here's an example of what rebellion looks like. God, as a man, I don't want what you have made for me, a woman. Instead, I want a man. God, as a woman, I don't want what you have made for me, a man. Instead, I want a woman. And he's going, here is a perfect picture for us of what it looks like to rebel against God. Is he saying that those who sin by same-sex relationships are worse than, uh, than people who don't sin that way, but sin other ways? No, he's not saying that. He's saying, here's a portrait for you to understand exactly what rebellion looks like. In the same way, men and women, a man and a woman, husband and wife united together, points us to the gospel. A man and a man together sexually points us to rebellion because it's anti-creation. So what has happened in the meantime? 
In the meantime, we have just not known what to do with the full speed, like Romans 1 on steroids, that is all around us. So what I am seeing well-intentioned, and I think people who love Jesus and are trying to be faithful do, is either be silent on this issue or cave on this issue. And they think they're doing it out of being loving. Those who are being quiet, usually are probably more scared. And, but those who are caving, I think they're really deep down inside, they're scared too, but they want to come across as being loving. Because the worst thing you want to be known as, say, I mean, I don't want to be known as a bigot. I don't want to be known as somebody who's, you know, hates people or I don't want to be known as, I want to be known as somebody who follows Jesus, right? But we're letting the world's narrative say that unless you affirm what happens in Romans 1, as in the full rebellion against God, that you are all these things, unloving, closed-minded, out of touch, bigoted, you know, all these type of things. And what I'm telling Christian college students and Christian ministry leaders that, we, that they need to do, and I know it's easier said than done, but it's start drawing some lines in the sand and saying, like, here's what we believe to be true, not because we're bigoted, because God's made it so clear in his word. That doesn't mean you stand on the corner of the student union and scream at people when they walk by, if they're holding hands with the... No, what I mean is in our own ministries, that we hold this up as, and we really believe this. Like, and we're unashamed of this. We have an entire biblical framework and story from Genesis all the way through the end that lifts up and elevates God's design as great and God's design as good. Now, sin, again, marriage existed before Genesis 3. So sin has messed that up. So of course we're inconsistent. Of course we see in heterosexual marriage, lots of issues. You know, we see divorce, we see abuse. You know, we, we see, you know, we see those things happen because sadly, because we're in a fallen world. So what do we need to do as Christians? We need to be, we need to recover and pursue God's design, which is a man and a woman married to each other who are serving each other, loving each other, uh, like Christ loved the church. And at the same time are unashamed of that design. Because there was a time when people were naked and felt no shame. So now people are saying, yes, but what about? Because here's what's different about your, your generation or the generation you're trying to influence and reach. For the first time ever in a generation, they actually regularly know people who are same-sex attracted or in same-sex relationships. The generations before you, my generation, it was more kind of an ivory, ivory tower thing. We just talked about sometimes. It never really came up very often because you really didn't know very many people who were gay. Either they were like deeply closeted or for some, I'm just going to be honest here, it would, it, the trend hadn't happened yet. You know, so there are some that I think deeply wrestle with these desires. They're, they're really wrestling with them, trying to figure out how to do these. Like they really figure out how to live their life faithfully with these desires. There's others who just kind of jump on the bandwagon, right? You see a lot of uh, girls being influenced, uh, young teenage girls towards transgenderism via TikTok and other, and other ways. It's like, a, it's like a phenomenon that's taking place. Like the percentages were like 25% of Gen Z uh, um, identifies as, as homosexual. It's like, how's that even possible? But the, like, the, how's that even possible? And, and the world wants to go, well, they're finally feeling free to say it out loud. I just don't think that's true. I think it's being cultivated. I think it's being influenced. I think it's being manufactured. That does not mean I don't think there's people who really do struggle and really do have, are really trying to figure this out and are really having a hard time and really do feel the way they feel. Um, what I'm saying is that cannot allow us to retreat on this issue if we really do love God and love people. Uh, for example, um, I am, you might say, what if you're born that way? Okay, and in a fallen world, I mean, of course I'm going to concede that's possible. We live in a fallen world, right? Why would that not be possible? Uh, so everything about us has fallen apart from Christ. So I am, this, 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 uh, is that an Amber alert? I'm oh, sorry. So sorry, people listening to the recording. We had a buzzer go off my bad. Uh, so I um, hope this isn't TMI, but I am someone as a male who I think I was born this way to be attracted to women. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm a male. I'm a heterosexual male. The great minority of our world today on social media. <laughs> so not in population, but social media. Um, so, however, because I'm attracted to females, who I believe God made me that way, that, that does not give me the right to lust, pursue, engage, do something physical, be inappropriate, say something out of bounds to another woman. Because God has not given me the design for that to be possible. God has allowed me in the scriptures and every other believer to be with one woman who is my wife. 
not 100 women, not two women, one woman. Like that's the parameters for God's glory and for my good that he has given is I'm a man. And so therefore I want to be with this. This is the person where all this is the one flesh union is played out. So even though I was born and created to desire females, that does not mean I get to live out my desires any way I choose. Now I understand that that's not necessarily apples to apples because I'm able to get married as a heterosexual to a woman, as God designed, where someone who's trying to follow Jesus and has same-sex attraction is not allowed to be a one-man man, man, right? So I get that's not apples to apples. What I am saying is that struggling with desires is not a unique thing for the Christian life. Like in our fallen state, we're told that creation groans and is longing for Christ to appear, Paul says he has a thorn in his flesh that he can't get away. But, you know, when he's weak, God's strong. Paul even acknowledges desires in Romans 1 as real things. And what he's saying is, even though it is a long, painful, for some people, journey here on earth, if we're trying to follow Jesus faithfully, we can't give in to those desires. If it's greed, if it's revenge, if it's heterosexual, sexual activity, people who are not my wife, or if it's same-sex attraction. So somehow we have created a God in our own image who exists for us rather than us exist for him. So it sounds crazy, even in Christian culture, to suggest that God's will for someone is for their holiness. So better to be someone who struggles with same-sex desires and remains celibate and single than to act on those desires, even that lasts your entire life here on earth, because we believe this world is temporary. And we've forgotten that. So what we've done, we've let our emotions and messaging manipulate common sense from the scriptures of things we know to be true, where we'll be staunch about the need to go to the mission field and that we believe that Jesus is the only way and we believe we should help the poor and we believe we believe in power of prayer. But something that's just as clear in the Bible, we think it's almost outrageous if you proclaim it and call people to it. So we have a person in our church who came to me about 10 years ago, a really faithful member, and he's a single guy. He's in his upper 30s probably. And he's a small group leader. He came to me, asked, asked to meet about 10 years ago, still, still active in our church. And he said, hey, can we get together? And he talked to you about something really important, you know, kind of confidential. And I said, yeah, yeah, come on. So he comes by my office and he goes, so I just need to let you know something. You know, I'm leading a group now. And I said, yeah, it's great. Thanks for doing that, for giving your time. It's really awesome. He goes, well, I need you to know that I'm gay. And I was like, oh. And I said, okay, what do you mean by that? And he was like, what do I mean by that? Like, what do you mean? What do I mean by that? Like, like I'm gay. I'm like, I, I understand that. But like, what do you mean when you say that? I wasn't being combative. I was just asking him. I think he was nervous, you know? And, and, um, he goes, I don't understand the question. I said, so like by saying you're gay, are you like hooking up with men? Like, do you have a boyfriend? Like, like, are, like what do you mean? Or do you have desires? Like what do you, he goes, Oh no, 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 no. He said, I, I like, I believe clearly in the Bible's, the Bible's clear design for sexuality. I just have same-sex desires that I struggle with. And I just want to be upfront with you about that. And I just, I want to make sure that it doesn't disqualify me from leading a, a small group. I said, of course it doesn't. I said, I, I said, absolutely not. It doesn't disqualify you. I said, I appreciate you coming to me and being honest about it. I said, but here's the deal. I said, you're a single, in my eyes, you're not a same-sex attracted person. You're a single man who follows Jesus. I said, so, I said, however, I understand that you have struggles. If you need someone to talk to about your struggles, I said, I'd be glad to you know, be in your life and talk about those kind of things. But I don't put like qualifiers before Christian. Like, I think you're a Christian. And I think your status is that you're a single male. In the Bible, there's only, only categories really are like widow, married, single. Like dating's not a category in the Bible. It doesn't make it bad. It just makes it kind of hard to figure out. Like we invented dating, you know, like it's, it's, it's so, um, so I told him, I said, so here, I just got to leave, here's my expectation on you. I said, my expectation on you is the exact same it is on everybody else. For the married person that's a small group leader, my expectation on them when it comes to sexual ethics is that they live out biblical sexual morality, which means the only person they're able to be with is their spouse. My expectation is the same of you. I said, but first, we have a lot of single adults who are small group leaders. 
my expectation is the same one. They're not hooking up, that they're not, like they're actually living their lives like in, pure, in purity. Like they're living, they're pursuing God and living holy lives with their sexuality that honors him. And says, my expectation is the exact same on you that it is on them. And he was just like, huh, I never thought about that. I said, there's one catch. He was like, oh no. <laughs> and I said, you have to fully reject the lifestyle. I said, I don't mean online or verbally. I'm like, you can't like date a guy. Like even if it's like innocent and like, you know, we have to reject that as an, like, even if you don't ever touch each other, like, like you can't, you can't have a boyfriend. I said, because that's just totally out of step with Christianity. And he's like, oh, I totally get that. I said, he goes, I don't want to, like, I want, I, goes, I want to marry a woman because I just have these desires you know, that I've had since I was a young boy that are same sex. I know it's, there's a lot of layers and it's really complicated and, and like, and all, and all those things. And he's still a group leader and still thriving in our church, but you know what he's doing? He's living his life as a single man following Jesus in community with the church and other Christians and he's refusing to act out the desires he has. In the same way, I would call a heterosexual single person in our church to be able to do that. Again, I understand it's easier said than done. But Jesus also said to pick up our cross and follow him. And we become, we've moved so far from that understanding that we don't even really know what it means anymore. My buddy back home knows what that means. Like for him, it's that. For some of our folks in our church who are 40 and single and heterosexual, like, they, they know what that means. Not that it's a curse, not that it's bad, but, like, sometimes they do get lonely. Sometimes they do long for marriage. They do long for, and I say, it's okay to long for things. But as we long for things, we continue to live in God's design because he hasn't called us to anything else but holiness. So our goal in, in, in doing ministry uh, to people on our campuses that are involved in the sexual revolution, the gender stuff, all the deal, this is just me talking here. This is just my opinion. Like, I think I have biblical grounds for this. My goal for an unbeliever is not that they share my views on homosexuality. Like, there's straight people in hell right now. Like, I don't care if a gay person becomes not gay. And I think it's better for them to not be just simply because of, like, human flourishing and, like, living in common grace that God's design. But for an unbeliever, I'm not as concerned with their desires as I am their soul. Like, I want to see them come to actual faith in Jesus. And then let discipleship do the work and help them pursue God's design in their lives. So I, think it's, so, I, so I think we have to be sure that we're clear that our goal, we're not on some mission field to go make gay people straight. We're trying to reach lost people and tell them about Jesus. But to follow Jesus means this is what we all do together. So again, there's people who have never desired a person in their life besides their spouse who are in hell right now because they never knew Christ and they're never forgiven of their sins. So we need to make sure we're clear on the mission. And the mission is not to go win some culture war. The mission is to make disciples. But in our disciple making, this has become a huge issue that's right in front of us all the time. And it becomes a hurdle towards evangelism because the church right now is kind of viewed as like, oh, you're the ones that are like obsessed with gay people and like, you know, hate gay people and all these things. And it's like, actually, no, um, we're sadly having to react to it. Why does the church always talk about sexuality? And why, why is it always such a thing? Why? Well, if people, why don't you talk as much about stealing or gossip? Or I'm like, well, somebody started writing books and preaching sermons. It's okay for Christians to gossip. We'd probably spend more time talking about that. Like if somebody wrote, wrote a new, did a, did a podcast on why it's okay for Christians to commit adultery, we'd probably spend more time talking about that. When you have professing Bible-believing Christians who claim this, that are saying that, oh, it's okay, yeah, that's why we haven't talked about it a lot. Because it kind of is the issue of our day in the same way Paul talks about things in here that were the issue of their day. I don't have to talk about temple prostitution on Sunday morning very often. Because our church in Tallahassee is not dealing with that. You know what we are dealing with? Sexual morality. People doing permanent things with temporary people. But you know what we have? We have a message of life change. We have a message of redemption. Of you don't have to stay in that sin. You don't have, whatever the sin is, right? So we want to be people who lift up Christ, but lift up the gospel in these places where people where there's brokenness. So the place there's probably some of the most brokenness right now in our culture is family issues, right? It's internet issues with pornography. Um, it's Un, you know, kind of unmet expectations. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of brokenness there with people who are promised the world and it didn't work out. So now they're bitter and they're angry. Um, there's the gender and sexuality issues. Like, so we have a chance to really do that, to really proclaim Christ here. So I think there's kind of four things we're seeing right now. And I'll, I'll be quick on this. There's, there's four things. And those are number one in our culture is that marriage has become a capstone rather than a cornerstone. And I write about this in my book a lot, how I don't think there's an age you have to be married by. I don't think anything like that. I'm not going to be that like weird Christian guy that thinks you have to be engaged like when you're 19 or whatever. 
Um, that's great if you are, I think, but I don't think it's like, it some kind of rule. But marriage is designed to be what you build your life from together. It's become now what you build your life to. So what you're seeing folks do now is after I get all my degrees, after I save $100,000, that's actually a real thing. People think you should have to raise $100,000 or, or save $100,000 before I get married. I'm like, who's ever saved $100,000? <laughs> like, that's a very rare person, right? Uh, and and um, after I backpack Europe and study abroad and, and knock six items off my bucket list or after we live together for four or five years and make sure we're compatible, then and only then will we consider getting married. I guess we will rather than it being something we build our lives to, which has created a lot of things. That's one's created a lot of sexual morality. It's created a lot of confusion, a lot of brokenness, because now dating has become kind of fake marriage, where you have all the benefits of marriage, companionship, sex, um, you know, share, share a rent, or whatever it could be, without the covenant of marriage. So really it's kind of a faux commitment. So as marriage is delayed longer, you're seeing these people that are in dating relationships for three or four or five years. And for a Christian, it doesn't really make sense because the goal is not an anniversary as a boyfriend or girlfriend. <laughs> the goal of dating is to pursue marriage. So for people that are 26 years old and have had the same boyfriend or girlfriend since they were 20, it's kind of like, what are you doing? Like, if you're a believer, why aren't you moving towards marriage? And they'll say things like, well, you know, we want to save money. It's like, well, wait a second. You can, like, you live together. So you can both afford to pay your rent now. So when you got married, couldn't you still afford to pay your rent together? Oh, yeah, but, you know, all, all these things. Well, here's what we're saying. We're saying that financial stability is more important than sexual morality. And then there's, and we're talking about Christians here. And then there's a couple. It's like, yeah, we live together, but we're not sleeping together. It's like, liar, liar, pants on fire, right? Okay, so, you know, like, like, I'm worried about you now, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. Uh, so, uh, as my kids would say, liar, liar, pants on fire. So, uh, I, so, but I think one of the biggest issues is we're delaying marriage too long. And I don't mean that, like, you should rush into it. A lot of times the reason why someone isn't married is they just haven't met someone yet that they want to spend the rest of their lives with. Okay, those are all yes, yes, yes. I'm not, I'm not, tr I'm not trying to shove marriage down your throat. What I'm saying is that dating is not a category in the Bible which means that we had to make it up, which we had to make up the rules. And the world made up the rules for dating. So it doesn't make dating bad, it just makes it neutral. So, but in our culture, the way you meet someone is through dating. So we had to participate in that. You know, as Christians, we participate in our world system. So the complicated is how as a Christian do I live this out in that context? And what usually happens is you see like a fake marriage. They wouldn't call it that, but like, you know, like, a, like a fake marriage. Um, I saw, there's a couple in our, I felt so, I felt so bad. Everybody's making fun of me. Uh, but I, there's a college uh, couple in our church that I follow on Instagram, uh, one of the guys and, uh, and, his, and his girlfriend. And um, they took these pictures on the beach and I thought they were engagement pictures because it was like the most like professional, like they're like, gra they're like grasping each other. And like, he's like bending her over like this, like in a dancing move. And there's pictures of them like kissing. And it's like, these are really well done pictures. And I thought they got engaged. So they just like posted the pictures and I commented, congratulations. So happy for you guys as their pastor on Instagram. And it was just them taking like couple pictures. And I'm going, I don't think it's a sin to take pictures like that. I'm not going to be that, I'm not, I'm not, not legalistic, but I'm like, is that kind of weird? <laughs> like, like you're just like what? Like that's you're taking pictures as like boyfriend and girlfriend, like you're married. And what's next? Like Christmas cards from each other together, like combined Christmas cards. Like, like what's next? You know, kind of thing. And let's say I'm just trying to give us perspective about like what dating's become in our culture is become. It's like a pre. It's almost become like a a JV version of marriage, and it was never designed to be that. So we need to point people towards. So I would tell someone that if you're not ready to get married anytime soon because you have some plans that are pretty set in stone, go study abroad, work on your PhD, whatever it could be. Our student, and you're going to be around a lot of students who are, you know, who are in that boat. If you're a Christian, again, I'm not talking unbelievers, not the Christians. I just wouldn't date then. I just wouldn't date until then, until you're ready. That doesn't mean there's pressure on you. The first date you go on when you're ready means you have to like decide right then if you're going to get married. I'm not saying those kind of things. But if marriage is nothing and you have any desire to do anytime soon, it's fine. Why would you date? Like Why? Because you're creating an environment where you're doing things as a couple. Like, because I, I had a guy in our church one time say that he believes that, it's from a college student, like, it was really kind of, kind of profound. He said, the only thing that changes when you get married as a Christian shouldn't be just that you can have sex now. Like, there's much more to it than that. 
So you see couples, dating couples that like emotionally are so attached to each other and act like they're married and like, like things that aren't designed to be for someone who isn't your spouse. So just be careful, you know, so just, just be careful of those kind of things. And, but in our culture right now, marriage is a capstone, not a cornerstone. And the church shouldn't mirror that is what I'm saying. That we should value marriage as God's design and, and try to build our lives from it, not to it as a destination. So I hope that's helpful, that thought. Um, and the second thing is that porn is the norm. It's a huge issue right now. You almost have to assume, uh, especially the men in your college ministry, or that there's a decent amount of them that struggle with it. Uh, it's become an issue for, for women as well. Um, it's, it's one of those things where I, I, for some reason, I always still get, I'm still surprised. There'll be somebody that sits me down to tell me they have a porn problem or they'll sit down with their college pastor and talk about a porn problem who I never in a million years would have guessed. Like it used to be a long time ago is you just kind of like creepy and you're like the guy in your parents' basement. And now it's just like your regular person that has a phone that you would never think. And they get just addicted to it. And it's going to, one, it's sin, you know, it's, it's, it's lust, but also the things it does to your mind. Like it's going to hurt your future relationships. Like God knows what he's doing and how he cares for us as sexual ethics. Like he's caring for us. So like it, it is impossible to be addicted to pornography and not have an effect on your future marriage relationship. The only, the only solution is that God intervenes. You know, that God does something in their life. Um, I've seen married couples that have the positive have porn issues and um, the wife felt like she was cheated on. Like he, like he committed adultery is how she felt because he's seen this other woman that's not her in those ways. We got to take it really seriously. So uh, there's ways to do it. Cause I know it can be very embarrassing for people to confess those kind of things. Uh, so there's ways to, you know, I wouldn't like go on stage on a Tuesday night gathering at your church and go, Hey, we got a, you know, recovering porn ministry, you know, Bible study Tuesday nights at, at Jim's apartment. We're going to have pizza. You know, I, I, there's ways to go about doing it, but just like be aware that that's a real thing and a real struggle with an epidemic right now. And I think one of the things that has to happen is where we've seen guys have victory there is when they've confided in another peer who's a friend who they trust, like another Christian brother, oftentimes a roommate, uh, you know, somebody that that's where we've seen a lot of wins where that person is like for them, like is rooting for them, praying to them, asking them questions, holding them accountable, those type of things. Um, so that's the thing. Uh, the third thing is, and we've already, uh, we've already talked about it. And that is that, um, that's, that gay is okay. Uh, that's become a thing in our culture, like on steroids, many churches and Christians have bought into that as well. And I don't need to get into that subject anymore, but just know there's absolutely no way possible, no way possible to be able to claim you're an Orthodox Christian and affirm same-sex marriage or relationships as okay. There's just no way. There's zero way. Um, You might as well be a Christian that says that we shouldn't care about poor poor people. I mean, like, it's it's like, it's like that, it's like that clear, like that out of bounds. Um, When Jesus talked about that all the time, right? Uh, So it's, it's, it's an epidemic. It's everywhere. It's not going away. So we have to figure out, continue to figure out how to minister faithfully in that. And I think the best way, one, is to have clear convictions, have to have clear convictions. But we have to draw lines. Not, not putting a sign outside that says, like, you know, no gay people allowed. Like, hopefully you hear my heart by now. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking to those who are in leadership in your ministry, especially. That they, like, we, have to make, we have to count that now as a new orthodoxy. That we have to. I really do think it's a new litmus test. Because if you cave in there, you're going to eventually cave in on other things. It's going to happen. It's inevitable. Because if you don't trust the Bible on that, why would you trust the Bible that Jesus is born of a virgin? Like, we took you to a whole thread of the scriptures here when we first started. Like, if you, don't, if you don't believe that, then why would you believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, the life? I wouldn't. Either we believe the Bible or we don't. You know, so I think that's where it starts. And that's an underrated thing. Because I think a lot of times, we're like, we want some kind of how-to guide of how to engage the world. And, and you know, it's, it, there's lots of different ways. But I think it's, it's not less than drawing clear lines. So I would say that your leadership of your ministry needs to be people who affirm God's design. And if they don't, that they don't need to be leading your church. They can come and be part of it, sure. But, you know, they can be in a small group and they can be there on Wednesday nights. And, but, but in terms of leadership, there's just, there's just no way. Uh, in the same way, we wouldn't have somebody be in leadership that denies the exclusivity of Jesus Christ for salvation. I think that's something that I don't think it's some lower tier issue is what I'm saying. I think it's become very, very significant uh, for what it is. And then from there, uh, just to realize that we need to be willing and ready to receive what I call refugees from the sexual revolution. This is under the gay is okay point number three. Um, And because the world is lying to them. And I think what we're going to see in the next decade, maybe less, is people who realize they've been lied to 
and they're going to be searching for truth. Because right now, people are not on a truth quest. Sadly, they're on a happiness quest. They just want, well, what can I do to make me more happy? And the world's telling them it's this. It's act out every desire you have. I know we already covered this a lot, but so I won't go too far into it. But I think we have to be prepared. What does it look like for our ministry to welcome refugees, broken people made in the image of God, who are coming out of these lies of you just go follow your heart. You do whatever makes you happy. Maybe you're not a boy. Maybe you're a girl. Maybe like they're going to realize they were lied to. Who's going to be the one that receives them? I would hope it's the church of Jesus Christ. Like I don't don't know if I ever see Jesus have more compassion than when he engages those in sexual brokenness in the Bible. Like he always is one of compassion. Like it almost seems like it's like compassion plus, you know, when he's the woman at the well. The woman caught in adultery. Like, like he just, there's just compassion that flows from his heart towards those who are broken. Uh, so I think we have to make sure. So I, think there's not, I don't think there's a how-to guide to that. I think it looks different for every ministry. But what does it look like for us to be ready with our strong convictions that God has a design and also our strong convictions that the world is broken in a mess to be able to receive people who are hurting and broken through this? Uh, the, third, the fourth thing is that sex is expected. What, like, used to be the first kiss is now to sleep together, truly. Um, I know at Florida State, I'll talk to college students, and they'll tell me that almost like to go on a date with someone now is to agree to sleep with them, like, in, in the secular world. And that's not, like, some extreme example. Like, it's just kind of expected, you know, um, that the only, like, the only value left is consent. You know, like, it can be with anyone, anytime, doesn't matter, you know, uh, so... Um, one thing you see at Florida State happen regularly is that uh, people will pack a bag when they go out at night, like with their friends, and they go out to the clubs and the bars in case they meet someone to go home with. They have a bag packed for the next day. It's just kind of part, and that's sad. It's just sad, you know, um, but that's, that's the culture right now. And these are like everyday folks from like suburban homes. Like their parents would die. These, these aren't these like, these people just like live, they, they think that they're like living the social college life. And that's like what they're supposed to do. And that's just kind of part of part of the culture. They want to be accepted, want to feel loved, uh, want to be included, you know, whatever. Don't, don't want to be the one, you know, I mean, I, I was talking, we were, I, one of our, our college staff members was telling me about a, a, a girl she was discipling who was like embarrassed that she was a sophomore at Florida State and still a virgin. And she's like embarrassed and like felt like she had to like do something about that. And it's like, okay, here, let's start this discipleship journey. It's going to be a long one, you know, kind of thing. But, but that's just the expectation, you know, but what's going to happen? She's being lied to. And she's going to, you know, she's going to feel brokenness. She's going to be engaged with someone who doesn't care about her, but just wants her to be, you know, just wants to hook up or wants her, you know, something along those lines. I don't want to be inappropriate in my language. I'm being careful how I word that. But, um, but that, that's reality. That's not some fringe example. That's not from some romance novel. I mean, that's like, that, that's what we're seeing happen. And this is a regular everyday state university with sororities and fraternities and sports and just normal place uh, by the world standards of a college. It's probably very similar to what you experience. And you have people that like walk out of their sorority houses or walk out of their dorm to go out with their friends at night and they, you know, wear as revealing as clothes as possible. Um, I don't know if they're getting revenge or having to wear a uniform at their private school, K through 12 or what. But they're wearing as, you know, revealing as clothes as possible. I'm not here to judge that. I'm just telling you the story. And, um, and then they even pack a bag. It's not like a one person example. It's like part of the culture uh, that, that, that happens. And because like you're hoping that maybe you're going to go home with somebody or meet somebody or along those kind of things. Because sex is just expected. It's just kind of part of going out. And here's, and I don't mean this snarky, so I would not word it like this around unbelievers or around the wrong Christian context of immature people, but you almost want to ask the question, how's it working for you? Not in a snarky way, not in an I told you so way, but it's like, is it really working? Like with the world, are you really, like you're on a happiness quest? Are, are you really happy? Like, are you really feeling joy here? Like, yeah, you might've felt accepted and valued in the moment, but You'll hear people tell stories that in, in, in the act of things, they just feel numb. You know, it's just kind of like what you do. Uh, you know, and when you see what, what Paul is telling in 1 Corinthians 6, as I land the plane here, when he tells them that, don't you know when you lie with her, that you become one flesh with her? That is Paul's way of saying it's never just sex. It's never just sex. It is a oneness and a, uh, you know, Chandler calls it a mingling of souls. You know, of like people coming together in a way that God has designed for permanence, for his glory, for our good. And because of that, he's designed it very specifically. He's not holding out from us. He's given us a place 
to carry out the desires that he's given us that are good desires. They existed before sin, but they're meant to be carried out in the place that he has designed. So in a world that sex is expected, we have to be clear on what God has given us and not just to, hey, don't do this, don't do that. But here's the why. And that's why I began by walking you through the Bible story of how the one flesh union plays out throughout scripture to show us that this is not some like fringe thing, some outdated thing, some like, oh, random passage in Leviticus thing. You know, like it's like, this is, this really is God's design for his people, for us to flourish and for us to worship him. So I think one of the great mission endeavors today is to try to live for Jesus in a sexually saturated world. And uh, I appreciate you being willing to sign up for it. And I hope this was helpful. And uh, I kind of gave you hopefully some assurance and clarity and affirm your convictions about things, but also to show, just to talk about what's going on in our culture and how we don't need to have our heads, heads in the sand. We don't want to remove ourselves in the world. We don't want to resemble the world. We want to reach the world.